Over the course of the year and a half I've been doing this channel, something that has come up a lot in my reviews is how the vampire genre just flat out sucks now and not sucks in a good vampire way, but sucks in a sparkly way. But it's more than just that one series. I feel like the whole genre has just kind of just been just ruined over the course of the last 20 plus years or whatever. So people said, well, tell us about some kind of vampire story that doesn't suck, right? And so my question to you guys is, do you still want death or have you tasted it enough? Evil is always possible, and goodness is eternally difficult. The world changes and we do not. Therein lies the irony that kills us. It's an awful truth that suffering can deepen us, give us a greater luster to our colors, a richer resonance to our words. The only power that exists is inside ourselves. None of us really changes over time. We only become more fully what we are. Evil is a point of view. We are immortal. And what we have before us are the rich feasts that conscience cannot appreciate and mortal men cannot know without regret. God kills, and so shall we. Indiscriminately, he takes the richest and the poorest, and so shall we. For no creatures under God are as we are. None are so like him as ourselves. Dark angels not confined to the stinking limits of hell, but wandering his earth and all of its kingdoms. I've always been my own teacher, and I must confess, I've been my favorite pupil as well. As for Oblivion, well, we can wait a little while for that. Hey, what's up, bookworms and creatures of the night? Mike back one more time to talk some horror for Fright Fest. And today we are dipping into The Vampire Chronicles by Miss Anne Rice, the legend. Guys, this is a series that has stuck with me since I was a teenager. I've never found anything that's quite duplicated what I experienced reading this as a young man growing up. And we're going to talk about it now. I want to tell you a quick little story about how I discovered this series. Uh, 1993 is pretty much what I call my great awakening uh, when it came to literature. I moved to Houston that year. I knew absolutely no one. Uh, I was starting my freshman year of high school and I discovered we had a really, really good library in my high school. So I just kind of dove into lots of things there. That's when I first discovered King, which I've talked about numerous times. It's when I first really got into Michael Crichton. And there were three authors I was really into in high school. It was Stephen King, it was Michael Crichton, and it was Anne Rice. Those three right there pretty much embody my high school years, if you don't count stuff like rereading Lord of the Rings for the 800th time or rereading Dune for the 2000th time, okay? This story right here, I'm talking mostly about the original trilogy because it really, that was my introduction. You know, I got all three of those stories in one lump sum and it really just clicked with me. So I want to talk about it here and talk about really why you should read it. She began writing this story in 1973. Interview with the Vampire was published in 1976. Uh, it continued to through 2003. Uh, she went through a change in her religion, I believe. This has always been the story. Uh, she was, became a born-again Christian, and she felt like she needed need to be writing about the occult or vampires or anything like that. But I don't know if she just decided, hey, I can separate that in fiction or what. I don't know. I don't know what went on in her personal life. But in 2014, she revived this series, and it is still going to this day. 2018 is the most recent with Blood Communion. Guys, I've got the entire series up there. Uh, I'll talk about the series as a whole as I go along. But again, this, why you should read, is particularly going to be about the original trilogy. That is Interview of Vampire, The Vampire of the Stat, and Queen of the Dam, because in my opinion, there is not a better vampire trilogy out there to this day. But um, let's go ahead and talk about some of the uh, influences here. Uh, two spinoff series, uh, The New Tales of the Vampires and the 
Uh, the Lives of the Mayfair Witches, I believe it's called. I have not touched on either of those, so I won't really be talking about them in here. Uh, it's sold over 80 million copies, has seen two movie adaptations uh, with uh, what 1994 was the, the Interview of the Vampire, and then I believe 98 or 99, maybe later. I think it might have been like 2002 or so. I don't know, that's how forgettable that movie was, that Queen of the Damned adapted both the Vampire Lestat and Queen of the Damned into one movie. And we'll talk about the movies here at the end of this, but we're going to be talking mostly about the original trilogy again and why you should read it. And that begins, as usual, with getting into what is it about the Vampire Chronicles tells the tale mostly from the viewpoint of two vampires living through a couple of centuries through the present day. First is the account of the vampire Louis, who tells the audience how he became a vampire at the hands of the radiant and sinister Lestat, and how he became indoctrinated unwillingly into the vampire way of life. Then, from the viewpoint of the vampire Lestat, we get his tale of centuries-long search for others like him seeking answers to the mystery of his eternal, terrifying existence and trying to adapt to the changing world around him as we get closer and closer to present day. And that is very, very bare bones of what this series is about. It goes way, way deeper, but I think that that is what will get you through this trilogy. And that leads me into, like we always do, let's talk about what makes it good or bad. Look, to me, I'm going to start with the good, as always. The vampires are scary, okay? I, what I always say is I remember a time when vampires weren't sexy. Vampires were scary, right? Now, look, I'll be up front. Her vampires are sexy, but they're scary first. And you know what? What I think that she did so well with these characters was they were scary. They had things that we could relate to. They were tortured. This was not a glamorous lifestyle. This wasn't anything like you see... Uh, on the CW. This was not glorified. These were struggling, tormented creatures that were very horrifying. And they were struggling, well, some were, they were struggling with their place in the world and how the world was changing around them. So yes, first and foremost, the characters were very scary. Now look, again, yes, the vampires are sexy because anytime you have to deal with glamours and things like that, you're going to get into the sexiness of vampires, the allure of vampires. Uh, but that isn't their defining feature. I feel like that's where the genre has failed vampires since the turn of the century is that their defining feature is, oh, they're just so sexy. And I just, I can't get behind that. Um, I felt Anne Rice did such a good job of doing both. Uh, her vampires brood. They definitely brood. Uh, I, I think that... <laughs> They brew, but not in that kind of emo, whiny way that we've had, again, since, you know, the, the, the calendar turned over to the 2000s. I feel like vampires, even hers, kind of went that way, which I'll get into when I get into the later stuff in the series. But again, these were real issues that you see someone who is living through how the world has changed over the last 200 years and having to deal with that from their place in this world. And I think that's what really makes her vampires so much more unique than anything we get now. I think maybe the only closest, and you might, if you're a big hardcore vampire fan, you might find this funny. I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I felt like it found the right mix between sexy and scary vampires. It really, really did. This, way darker than that. Uh, I've heard a lot of people, I remember when True Blood first got really popular on HBO and people were advertising it as, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's like Twilight for adults. And I used to say, oh, well, you know, you could read The Vampire Chronicles, which is like vampires, but actually scary, was always the way that I always advertise it. And I always get a lot of pushback, especially doing a month dedicated to horror like this. Well, that's not actually horror. Look, this is defined as gothic horror, okay? Uh, I think that anytime you deal with vampires, people are going to want to put it under fantasy. They're going to put it under thriller or whatever. It's it, it is In your library, it is listed under gothic horror. So, again, I'm not the big subgenre guy. Horror, sci-fi, fantasy is why I put everything else. I'd put this under horror because you do have a lot of blood sucking going on this. And yes, the vampires can be very scary. I feel like these books are very much a character study. Uh, I, I talked about how they're, they're tormented and they're dealing with their place in the world. That is a huge, huge theme in here. But you're dealing with uh, one of our characters. I really don't want to get too much into spoilers, but he's dealing with, okay... His mentor is teaching him the ways to be a vampire, and he doesn't want to accept it. He doesn't want to take human life. He's like, we can live without taking human life. And other vampires are like, well, yeah, we can, but why should we? You know, we are the superior beings. It's just, it's just the way it should be. Uh, so it, it, it has a lot of moral issues that they have to deal with and a lot of uh, 
sexually repressed issues that we're going to talk about here in a minute. But again, I think first and foremost, this trilogy really is a character study about finding yourself, about finding your place in the world as the world changes around you. Because you think about, okay, you're a creature of the night, so things are already stacked against you. But as technology and human civilization advances, it's not going to be quite as easy to cover up what you are what you're doing, and all the missing people's reports that are coming up over the years, right? Uh, so it, it really shines a, a respectful and proper light, I feel, on the passing of time through these couple of centuries that these books go through here. I think the, res the relationships between these characters over that month, because there's a lot of characters that cross paths, they don't see each other again for another 70, 80 years, and it's just seeing how they miss each other, seeing how they wish that they had done things differently, how they wronged each other, how if they had it to do again, they would do it differently. Just, just real relationship issues that you feel like these characters are really going through. They're not just, you know, bloodthirsty maniacs. I say yes, that they're scary, but again, it's it's never once that they're, oh, they're just monsters. I mean, they're very, very human in their personalities and in their feelings and how their relationships work with one another. And that's very, very, um, makes it very personable, I think, to the reader. And one of the biggest things for me is that this was my very first experience with the unreliable narrator. The first book is told from the point of view of Louis, and the second and third books told from the point of view, mostly, of Lestat. And you see that they're recounting a lot of the same tale, and it's very, very different. And it's not in a, oh, well, the bad guy never thinks of the bad guy kind of way. You start looking at it, and you're like, okay, well, maybe Louis was going to a little bit of extreme in there. Oh, or maybe Lestat's not taking that quite as seriously as it should have been. You can really see both sides of it and be like, you know what? Maybe neither one of them were evil. Maybe they both were just very misunderstood. It's, it's really... Uh, it comes down to you, I think. And I think that's what made, uh, when I reread this uh, a couple years ago, that I really picked up some things I didn't pick up as a teenager. And being like, well, you know what? This whole time I've thought this, but now I'm kind of thinking this. So uh, she kind of leaves it up to you to decide, you know, what is actually uh, being fluffed for the, uh, for the person telling the story uh, to, to make them look like they're, they're better than they actually are or in some who might actually just be being a little bit uh, a little bit oversensitive about some of these things. You don't know. You don't know. Uh, I think that I have my opinion on it, but uh, you know, for everyone who has one opinion on it, another reader sees it totally a different way. So I think that was really genius using the unreliable narrator, where I feel like unreliable narrator these days is just an excuse for someone who has uh, beautiful writing, but they don't have a good story. I, I think the way that it's done here is done just just brilliantly. She doesn't pull any punches, okay, guys? The violence in this is 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 top level. It's 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 gory. It's bloody. I mean, you got vampires. You're going to have some blood. Obviously, it's very very important, very essential to the storyline. But uh, it, again, she doesn't shy away from this stuff. And you think when this was written, man, it's mid '70s. This is this is pretty brutal, right? So uh, I, I think that you're going to get the violence if you're kind of craving something like that. I feel like the, the violence is going to just been toned down in some vampire stuff lately. Besides, just oh, they bit the neck and a little bit of blood drip right here. No, uh, it's a lot, lot more violent than that. You have people like getting cut in half and decapitated and stuff like that in this, and uh, just torment. There's torture. There's all kinds of violence. So if you get a little squeamish, I don't think it's like too level of like uh like some of the grim dark fantasy these days something like that it's not just straight nihilism but again i'd say it's uh if it's in between pg-13 and r it's probably right there it's nothing that's going to make you like want to like turn the page and hurl on a bucket but uh it, it also isn't going to hold your hand and be like yeah it's going to be okay and rub your back at the same time uh so we talk about the violence let's talk about the sex yes obviously lots of sex in here and elephant in the room and rice was a champion for LGBTQ stuff long before the masses were. And her vampires are very, very erotic. And they swing both ways. And that is not anything that she ever shied away from. So if you're one of those people who is looking for something like that, I think that you will enjoy it. I feel like she does not do it in a preachy or demeaning way to anybody, no matter how you feel about it. I never feel like once it is kind of a political stance as much as it is, she makes her characters that you're so interested in that this is just a new layer, a new wrinkle to them where you're like, wow, okay, that's that's really one way to look at it. So regardless of how you feel on that issue, uh, I think that she's going to find a way to leave it up to you to decide. It never once feels like it's pushy. It never once feels like it's trying to cower away from things. She's going to 
tell you this is what is going on and it's not that big of a deal and it really isn't it really isn't uh, i i think it's great the way that it's, it's written in there but uh, the rock and roll uh we're gonna talk about the sex we're talking about the drugs we're gonna talk about the rock and roll now uh when this series leads up to what's going on in the 1980s rock and roll plays a very big part in this story so uh it's it's really interesting the way that she kind of was able to do like I, i've talked about like sometimes like the james bond movies if you just like marathon that box set you can just see how they always tried to be current with what the times were and you can see that she kind of tried to do the same thing she was rolling with the the 1980s hair metal movement and the way that she does it's quite clever honestly and it's one of the reasons i think that this series will never be able to be adapted properly which i'll get into when i talk about the tv adaptation uh but uh there is some bad here let's talk about the bad things here and the number one bad thing is this should have stayed a trilogy look I don't think that you'll find one person out there that is a fan of the series that will tell you it's still great today. Uh, I feel like everyone, even people that were mega fans like myself, they can tell you what book they probably stopped on. For me, uh, I got about halfway through Merrick. I was waiting so long for the Vampire Armand and then the Vampire Armand came out and I just felt like just absolutely just stabbed in the heart over how bad it was. And uh, I just, I've never really been able to get my groove back to go back. When I started doing my reread a couple years ago, I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to reread them all. I got through the original trilogy again and I stopped. Uh, it, it, it wasn't anything in particular that I felt like, oh, well, it's not good enough for me to keep going. I just had too many other things I wanted to read. And I was just like, I just don't feel like my opinions on it is going to change just because I'm older. So, uh, yeah, the it should have stayed where it did, really. It's like, it's like, she tried to build her world and make it bigger, and I can appreciate that, but the more and more she got away from the stop, the, the less interesting the series got. I mean, you had your main character that everyone either loved or loved to hate, and you started to get kind of away from him, and the series started to get away from her, in my opinion. So uh, I can't tell you. I have still, to this point, have never gotten past, what is that, book seven or eight? So again, I can't really say. That's why I'm telling you primarily... I think that you should read the original trilogy. I feel like it had a little bit of prequelitis in that you had these characters that we, as fans, all she did was was what we were asking for. We wanted the backstory for characters like Armand and Marius and things like that. And when we got them, they just felt like they were just kind of demystifying and they diminished the character a little bit. It's kind of like uh, the Star Wars prequels where it was like, yeah, we want to know the backstory of Darth Vader. And then we got it and we're like, yeah, they just kind of took all the mystery away from Darth Vader, right? And I felt like it kind of did a lot of that with some of the characters in her story here. So not her fault. Like I said, she did what we were asking for. It's just uh, one of those things that maybe it would have been better if we didn't get it because I felt like it just completely made some really great characters just boring and vanilla afterwards. Um, she could be a bit wordy. Uh, there can be times where I feel like you go through three or four chapters and absolutely nothing has happened. So uh, it gets worse once you get past the original trilogy. But I think even the Queen of the Damned, there's some times where you kind of feel like that. She can be a bit wordy and that might, that might deter you just a little bit. But, um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty much more good than bad, really. Again, if you stick with just the original trilogy, I think you're going to have a great time no matter what age no matter what gender no matter what you've read up to this point in horror i think that you'll have a good enough time because the characters are strong enough that i think everyone's going to find one that they can connect with in more than one way and that gets us into why you guys are here why you should read it look i want you to experience a time when vampires were feared in literature not just sexualized yes She's probably to blame for the way that the characters of for the whole way the whole genre went. She was very influential up through the 90s, and that's when everything started to turn. When she started to make her vampires super duper sexy, and that was like their only defining feature, it seemed like everyone they ever just kind of grabbed onto that, and all of a sudden it became a YA phenomenon. I don't know if it just got hijacked that way. I don't know if they were Anne Rice fans growing up and they just said, Hey, I think I've got a market here. I don't know. Obviously they're doing fine because you can go to any bookstore now and you will find the horror section about this big and you'll find YA paranormal romance this big. Okay. So it spawned a whole new genre. And I think that she, yes, she's, and this isn't necessarily a positive. Uh, uh, she, she's responsible for that. But again, I think you need to read this original trilogy to see what it was like before it got there. Because it was like the last hurrah, I believe, for the vampire genre of where they were actually 
entities to be feared and respected than they were just ones to just be fawned over. It was really, it's really, really weird. But again, gothic horror at its peak, when she was writing it, I, I can't think of anyone that was doing anything better with me. It's right up there with Salem's Lot and, and Bram Stoker's Dracula as my favorite vampire tale of all time. And I think that you're going to find plenty there to make you happy. Uh, she was a pioneer of a lot of the tropes, like I said, that you're seeing right now. But this is before they were actually known as tropes. And uh, yeah, like I said, it's kind of like the last great vampire tale before the tweens took over the genre. Another one is, look, if you like the movie, 1994 Interview with the Vampire, which in my opinion is a great movie. Uh, I know a lot of the book fans, because uh, I read the book the year before the movie came out, and I knew a lot of people in school at this point that uh, this was after I actually made some friends uh, <laughs> a year later, and a lot of them were actually disappointed with the movie. And I'm just like, why? Like, well, it's just, that's how I, I picture Lestat. Look, I didn't picture Lestat as Tom Cruise either, but you know what? I thought he did a really good job. Uh, the Brad Pitt, this is before Brad Pitt was Brad Pitt, really. And I thought he did a great job. Uh, Armand as Antonio Banderas, again, not what I pictured, but I really, really thought that they did a good job. But the thing was, is you weren't going to get a much better adaptation of the story than you got in there. It was violent, it was true to the source, and the actors all hit home runs in their part. And all you have to do is look at the cat back at the cast of that movie and say, yeah, they had a humongous draw with that movie. So it wasn't just, oh, it has a bunch of heartthrobs in it, so all the women went and saw it. All the guys went and saw it, and they loved it too. So if you love that movie, here's what I'm going to tell you. The book is better. It really is, especially if you want to talk about that Queen of the Damned movie. Look, first of all, you can't take Vampire Lestat and Queen of the Damned and cram it into one movie. It was never going to work. Second thing is, you're never going to do... I mean, they talk about this indescribable music that Lestat is able to make. It's just like, just magical, right? And then to have the movie come out, and it's corn. He's lip singing corn. Uh, look, I love corn, like anybody else that grew up in the in the 90s did, right? But uh, yeah, that wasn't what I pictured as the most beautiful, most amazing music ever made. I was not picturing corn, really. I wasn't. Uh, so I, I don't know if they're ever going to be able to adapt this properly. Uh, Hulu had the rights. They let it expire. Now AMC has the rights to it and the uh, the witches show that she or the witches series that she has. Uh, her and her son keep talking about how it's going to get made. I just don't know how it's ever going to get made faithfully again. I really think that 1994 movie is going to be the peak of what we're able to see. But again, if you like that movie, I think it's one of those things, like, like I said with, um, God, what was it? I think it was one of the Crichton ones. I don't remember what I said was, hey, say you like the movie, treat this as the director's cut. Because I feel like they hit all of the really big moments in that first movie, but there's still a ton of stuff that they weren't able to get to due to time constraints. So uh, yeah, definitely at least read Interview with the Vampire. I guarantee you're going to want to keep going because it's just that good. Now, if I have any final thoughts here, guys, it's just, I was such a huge fan of this series that it just kind of broke my heart when it ran out of gas. I always have said I'll go back to it eventually, plow through it. Maybe she recaptured the magic. I don't know. I haven't heard one way or the other because I don't know anybody who kept going with the series. It seems like every big fan of the series I talked to told me, yeah, this is the moment I've tapped out. Oh, it was either it was after uh, The Body Thief or it was after Merrick or if it was after uh, you know Blood and Gold. They all had a place where they tapped out. I never heard anybody say, oh yeah, she brought back Lestat. I'm back in. Yeah, she finally brought back Lestat to the forefront. And I just felt like nobody cared anymore. So take it for what it is, guys. What I always say is, Make up your own opinion on this stuff. Read the original trilogy. If you like it, keep going. I'm here to tell you, I think, why you should read the original trilogy is because I think you'll really like it. After that, it's kind of up to you. I, I, Again, I thought through about book five, it was still really, really solid. And then it just started to continue that trajectory downhill for me to a point where I just stopped going. But I have all her books at this point. I have two of them up there that are actually signed by her. And... Um, yeah, I, I keep buying them because you know that's just the, the, the curse of, of book collecting, right? But uh, yeah, again, like I said, make up your own mind. I think you're going to find plenty to enjoy in the original trilogy and then decide from there. Guys, so that is why I think that you should read The Vampire Chronicles by Anne Rice. It is, in my opinion, the most recent great vampire tale that we've ever had. But again, I got so tired of the genre after it got completely oversaturated with YA paranormal stuff that, uh, yeah, I just kind of tapped out. So there could be some really great vampire stories out there right now that I don't even know about. So maybe if you got some recommendations for me, hit me in the comments and guys, I will talk to you there.